Welcome Abayim to the third lecture in the series of lectures on the commentary of the Nitziv of Naftali Tzvi Yudha Berlin, on the Chumash, and the, which, is, which, which he called Ha'amagava. Now, um, in the previous Shia, we've, actually the previous two Shia, and we've been speaking about the Nitziv's introduction, the Kid Masa Emek, in which the Tziv outlines his procedure um, through which he's going to, um, that he's going to use in his commentary. Methodology. Right, I was say the methodology, right, thank you. And um, the Nitziv, um we mentioned last time, um, bases his methodology, or explains his methodology, based upon the fact that we see the terrorist called Shira. And the chief there goes on to speak about the the, the uh, distinction between what we call a po- poetry and between narration, narrative. And um, we spoke about that at length. And um, poetry is something which a person has to understand. You know, poetry is an expression of something else, which we called in, um, last week we called it the Zitzenleben. In other words, the context, whether it be the cultural, sociological, psychological, historical context, which gives rise to this expression. So therefore, Shira, the Torah being defined as Shira, it cannot be only understood on the level of um, philology, which means meaning. But at the, the Shira itself has to be understood as an expression of a context, of something else. That is the way we understood the Nitziv. And as an example of this, I spoke about the Nitziv's um, um, Pelosh, his commentary, his explanation of one of the seminal um, seminal episodes in the Chumash, that is Moshe Rabbeinu's um, hitting on the rock, the Kos HaSela. And I spoke about that the, for the Nitziv, the Zitz and Leibin, which we look for in the Chumash, is within the context of Chazal. Right? And I think what we left off was that the Nitziv in Bamidbar, Perechov, um, I think it's in the, in the Pasuk Vav, there the Nitziv um, describes the assembly of Klai Yisrael at the cellar, at the time when they had nothing to, there wasn't any water, and they were dying of, um, of thirst, that he likens this to the, um, the assembly of people, this Asfus Ha'am, which was the minic of Klai Yisrael, when there was a Tzeres HaKashamim, when there was a lack of rainfall, which is described in detail in Tainus, I think in Mishnahis in the second parak, and there we have the entire minhag that they would they would bring the the Aled outside from the um, from its permanent place in the shul, they take the teva out into the streets, and therefore there would be a tefillah barabim, and the chacham would get up and say divrei teira, right, divrei musa, and the the tziv understands that the context here that the context of Chazal, which is the his asfa sa'am, the assembly of people hakola sa'am at the time of Tzitz Kishamim is actually the context within which we have to understand what is going on when Klai Yisrael gather right in front of the cellar, in front of the rock um, during the, the um, you know, in, in, in the wilderness, in the desert. However, it's not enough just to understand the Zitz and Leib in this context, right, um, as a w- way of describing it, because actually there was a a very important, very monumental event. Moshe Rabbeinu, instead of speaking to the cellar, as he was commanded, he hits the cellar. He hits the rock. And this is a chait. And how do we, how do we understand this as a chait? And in particular, we see that previously in the Chumash, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu is commanded to hit a rock. He does Nisim and Shemais, for example. And uh, we don't, the, the Chumash didn't consider that to be a chait. So, the Nitziv, like I said before, is not going to understand the Zitz and Laban of Chazal just as the context of the halacha, but actually within a historical context too. And this historical context is not going to only include the Chumash, it's going, but it's actually going to be the historical context with, with, within which we understand the minhagim and the halachas of Chazal themselves. Um, the Nesib explains, at the very beginning of this, um, after this event, when the Jewish people are crying out that they're dying from thirst, and they're complaining, they want to go back to Eretz Mitzrayim, right? As it says in Perechov, right? 
in Pasakei, Velama Helisunu in Mitzrayim, why did you bring us out of Egypt? He brought to this terrible place. So there's no water to drink. So the Nitzir raises the question, why, I mean, what, what are they complaining about? Why are they complaining? In other words, they've been going for 40 years in the Midbar, they've seen all these things, and why are they complaining? So the Nitzir explains that, in fact, there's a revolution. There's a, a very fundamental change is taking place at this point in history. Paradigm shift. A uh, shift of paradigm. I'm going to get to that. That in fact, and this revolution is really cosmological and religious. That in fact, throughout the years in the Midbar, right, the Jewish people lived based upon nace, based upon miracle. Right? And the miracles actually, in other words, the existence of Klai Israel was contingent on nisim that were done, nisim, explicit miracles that were done by HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And people expected at each point when they would meet up with a hardship that there would be a miracle, there would be a fun, that there would be an unnatural change in nature. But in fact, Slivas explains this in his Hagdam introduction to Midbar, Kalei Yisrael now is being weaned off miracles. They're being weaned off an unnatural existence. And now the relationship to God would actually change and would actually move within a much more natural setting where in fact the emphasis would be on the man side of the God-man relationship and man was expected within the natural realm right, to rely upon prayer and upon Torah study and upon fast, introspection, etc., etc. So therefore because of this, even though in Shemais, Moshe Rabbeinu hits the rock, because when you hit the rock, that's an ace. It's an ace. It's literally an act of magic. You hit the rock and water comes out. But here, Moshe Rabbeinu is supposed to speak. Now, what is Moshe Rabbeinu speaking? He's not going to speak to the rock. He's not going to speak to the rock. It says in its if, right, that Moshe Rabbeinu was supposed to say Divrei Musa or Divrei Teira, as is outlined in the in the Gemara and Tainus. That's what he was supposed okay. to have done. What? That's okay. What? what? Ah, so okay. therefore, ah, so therefore, um, it says, right, in other words, if you look in um, Pasuk Vav, uh, Pasuk Ches, Pasuk Ches, right? 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 So it says that it's if, in other words, we're not speaking, they're not going to speak to the rock and say to the rock, give us water. That's ridiculous. You don't speak to a rock. I mean, if it's a nace, it's one thing, but there's not going to be an ace. What? But he says, Perush is batim devar halacha or perak echad, and then he brings, right? Then he brings, in fact, actually, and he goes on. This is in Diba Maschel, the Diba Tam Lasela, and the Amad Dava. V'ratz Hakadosh Baruch Hu Hashem Moshe Ve'Aron Yilamdu Sa'am Hech Yashul Deiras Be'Alt Yisrael. He wanted the Moshe Rabbeinu and Aaron should teach Klal Yisrael how they would do when they came to Alt Yisrael, which is the Mishnayos. Right, which is the Shmaiz and Tainus, that the Chacham and he quotes the Gemara and Tainus, actually Daf Yud and Aleph, right? Then speaks about that they would say Halacha and Musa, right, etc., etc. In other words, Moshe Rabbeinu Aaron was supposed to be to, to would be money would direct Klai Yisrael in the minute which is directed within Chazal. That's how the Sif understands it, right? And the Sif understands that in fact actually this would be a a Hakol which is which is, which is described in Chazal, in Masechah's Tainus. So what is it that saying over here? In order to understand the Chumash, we have to understand, number one, the historical setting, and number two, the historical setting in light of the emergence of the Hanhag of Chazal. Here we have the emergence of the Hanhag of Chazal. It was without Chazal, and without the more general ancient historical setting, it's unable to understand everything that's being said in the Chumash. That's what the Sivit is saying. Now, very, very interesting enough is, is that you could actually um, take this from the other end too. Because if you really examine, this is, um, in other words, this is Neifa Chamidali. In other words, this is my own two cents. But I understand that the Sivit is giving us incredible insight into really Chazal themselves. Because if we look at the Anhaga of Chazal and the Tainis, where they take the Teva and they bring it out of the, out of the Shul, and they place it on the street, and it's divrei Torah. In fact, 
How do we to understand this minic? So I understand the minic is, is that within the shul, one can understand within the shul, that's a, like a divine setting, and that's a, what's called say, an unnatural setting, or it's a setting where one would expect more hashkacha, in other words, all of the, um, all of the red, the, 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 the normal and set religious elements are in place, right? Mikdash ma'at. Once you go out of the shul, already you're subject to the laws of Teva, you're in the street. So in other words, the entire Hanhagas Hatayis of Chazal has to be understood in the context of actually the Chumash, where in fact the Jewish people now are being forced less to rely upon what's called Nais and Miracle, but rather the, um, the religious operative is to fast, this Tainis, this Tefillah, this Divrei Teira. In other words, the Jewish people are being forced, or the the nation is being forced to actually introspect to Bichayzeh B'tshuva, to mechazik themselves, and as a result of that, the Kodesh Baruch will bring about right, rain and bring about prosperity. So in other words, what the Mitzvah is using the Chumash as the context through which we can understand not only its own Zitz and Leben, but actually Zitz and Leben or Chazal themselves. And in fact, this is a very important, um, uh, it, it comes out, that since the Mitzvah's perish is being historicist in a certain sense, right? Then, in fact, this is a, a, a very important technique of the Mitzvah, which I think really distinguishes him from other commentaries, is that he understands very, very thoroughly that there are changes that are taking place along the course of the Hamisha Chum Shetera. So, for example, yeah. We use the historicist or what, what Within the historical context. In other words, the Chumash has to be understood within the historical context, but not, in other words, when I say historical context. Okay, well, and, what's the alternative? No, the other one means that the, 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 the Chumash is type of a flat land. And all we have are Shtiklach Torah. We don't understand the con- that there's actually a change of paradigm. There's actually a historical change that's taking place at this moment. In other words, when people look at the Chumash, even though they know the Kleist of Adam Mitzrayim, but no one thinks of Bamidbar as actually expressing a very important historical change, that the, that the, the situation, the historical context of Klai Yisrael in the volume is not at all similar to the historical context of Klai Yisrael at the time of Shmois. It's In other words, that actually there are different, there's a cultural, different cultural setting, there's a diff, and therefore there's a different relationship with God, and therefore, in fact, the entire um, context of religious observance and man's relationship to God and the cosmos is entirely different. Yeah. In, in other words, the alternative would be flat. Is flat flat land. In other words, meaning, uh, the Chumash the, 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 the term takes a word here and a word here. Right, 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 right. They, 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 no, there's nothing behind the text. There's no cultural context behind the and text. And the and Shemais is the same as the Pasuk and Right. If I look, right. right. In other words, if I look at the text, I don't understand. There's, there's no there's no underlying historical right. historical setting behind the text. All I have a text, and I have meaning that emerges from the text. Mm-hmm. Whereas here, before I understand the text, I first have to understand the historical setting, and only on the basis of that can I understand the text. Everyone says that, like for example, Bereshis, but Kodem Matan Torah, Ramban, not everyone, Ramban, for example, says there's a difference before Matan Torah and after Matan Torah. But that's only a halachic difference. That might be a halachic difference. Otherwise, there might be the before Matan Torah, for example, they didn't have halachas, this and that. For example, the Ramban will speak about Yibo. Right. Okay, but that's a, di- that's a different but issue. That, that's a different thing, and that's the right. But I don't think that anyone, for example, is going to say that in fact that here we have actually an entire change of the halichas oil of Klal right. Yisrael. I think this is really the it. Even up let's say, Tzadik will say that, you know, the first Abba Chubshet is Tersh Vechsav and Tersh Vechsav. That's all on the level of Whoosh, mm-hmm. on hermeneutics. Yeah, yeah. Here the Nesiv is creating actually a, a saying that actually there's a historical setting. Even the Rambam and Mayan of Uchem and the Tamiya Mitzvah she learns that Klai Yisrael are being weaned off paganism, but it's not a historical context within the no. Chumash itself. Right. It's merely a halacha kept to form what's called the Tamiya Mitzvah. But the Nesiv actually, in fact, details what takes place in Bamidbar. He almost even actually wants to claim that Bamidbar is actually composed of separate, sep- separate Chumashim, I should call Chumashim separate books as the Gemara speaks about in Kol Kisvei, yeah. and in fact it brings a Chazal um, that says Va'art Haisa Soiva Vaya in the Hagdama to Bamidbar. So the Siv actually brings um, a Chazal, right? It brings um, um, that there's um, a, a Shino that takes place in Pashas Chukr. V'zal Shino Yisrael Oydim Bamidbar, right? 
Ah, he says, Mishum Ikaz HaSefer, the main point of Bamidbar, who are machlif umishan alikaz amashem. The Jewish people are changing, there's a changing, right? And the, in the, in the setting, in the Jewish people setting in the world, Bechayilam, right? Mi azi gil el chesroyal, min adar shochu bamidbar. For the time of the midbar, they were in the midbar in the desert. Shem midbar hayum is nagim bamidas tef eresh, liman moshe, lamaylam alikaz hateva. No, it's a midbar. They're living a life based upon this, based upon miracle. Over El Yisrael, Halchu B'Del Chateva. B'Sisri Hashkoch. Hashkoch would be hidden. They would live in a natural setting. And he says, V'zeh Hashinu Yitzchil, Oydem B'Midbar B'Shnas Aboyim. This change took place in the 40th year. K'moshi B'Yal Pashas Chukas. Now we're in Pashas Chukas, chapter 20, verse 5. Right? Zeh Hashinu, right? And, and this is a change. And then he brings an incredible Chazal. Right? According to the Tziv, it's called HaTeratula. Bereshis Rabba Perekimel. V'yad Elokim ben Or ben Achoyshek. Zeh Sefer Bamidbar. How you like that? So, the Tziv understands that the Chumash is not a hermeneutical flat land, but rather, the Chumash is detailing an entire history of a people whose context cosmological and therefore religious context, right, is in fact um, undergoing a fundamental change from one in which people live in a world of miracle to a context in which people live in a natural setting and where the focus is on individual devotion through tefillah and through limanatayla. That's what the Nesim is coming to say. So in other words, based upon this evolution, this cultural and cosmological and therefore religious evolution, within this context one has to understand what takes place in the Chumash. And this is, in my opinion, very, very uniquely, is unique to the Tziv's commentary on the Chumash. Now what's very, very interesting is, is that and the Tziv mentions early in Kid Masa Emek is that we have to understand, Tziv says explicitly, we have to understand that a commentary in the Chumash is like science, the act of scientific observation. And Tziv says that we make laws, we make rules, scientific laws. He says scientific or literary analysis? The lit- no, the, no, he says the, the commentary in the Chumash, the, 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 no, Chumash, is likened, the Chumash is likened to the world. And the commentary is like the commentary in the Chumash, understanding the Chumash, is likened to scientific understanding of the world. That's what the Ziv says. It just says that even though a person might see certain anomalies in nature, and might understand that these are complete anomalies which are not natural, eventually in history, through greater scientific analysis, well, a person will in fact actually understand these things scientifically, as the Ziv says. Could possibly be is that, you know, in a certain type of a life imitating art, that the Tziv is actually alluding to that here too. That in other words, as throughout history, there's a natural process by which more is understood from the natural aspect of nature. In other words, this evolution from the Midbar to El Chisrael, where Klaes will undergo a, a very radical change of paradigm from a, an, a life, Lamayla Min Teva, to a life within Teva, is also be understood in the general context of human history, where man's scientific understanding makes less of nature, which you would call the Maila Minateva, there's less nice and much more things that are understood in science. And in virtue of that, man's relationship to Kodesh Baruch right, changes as a result. The focus is, an, an, and actually, so it's the Tziv's commentary, and Tziv applies this to his commentary, that there are things in the Chumash that perhaps we don't understand in previous generations, and that through... Um, through um, continued analysis, we begin to understand more of the grammar and more an understanding of the Chumash itself. So in other words, the, that's what the Tziv says in the Skid Masa In other words, what am I trying to say? What I'm trying to say is, is that life imitates art. The Tziv understands that as throughout history, our commentary in the Chumash is able to understand things that perhaps we didn't understand in previous generations. And it could possibly that the Tziv is actually declaring here, I'm saying this, the Tziv is not, but I'm saying this, that I'm a 20th century, or I'm, I'm an, I am a 19th century commentator, I'm a modern commentator. And because of that, since in the 19th century, it could possibly be that the historical analysis of past events, of ancient events, right, 
become, became a greater tool which was wielded by scholars. So too did the Tziv says, and, and in fact actually there were important revolutions that took place within science too, even within the Tziv's lifetime. So too the Tziv has this commentary that in fact the more we understand about the nature of events, the historical context within which the Chumash was written, the more we can appreciate the Shira aspect, the poetry after the Chumash is expressing those events. That's what I want to say in the Nitziv. So in other words, the Nitziv is providing, which I think is very, very unique as a commentary on the Chumash, a commentary on the Chumash, and um, moreover, right, in the history of Palshanut, of, com- of, 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 of commentary, commentary, namely is is that an appreciation and an understanding of the zitz and laban of the Chumash. Of course, all of this is related to Chazal, because Chazal, in fact, themselves, right, are those who are transmitting this historical tradition, this historical tradition, right, to us, that within this historical context guided by the understanding of Chazal, we could better, best, better understand the Chumash as expressing, right, the ideas and the Devar Hashem within that context. I see you have a question. Okay, fine. Anyway, so this is, this is in fact, what the Chumash is saying. Here. Now, what's interesting is, is, is that the Nitziv uses this technique in a quite a number of places, in fact, an untold number of places. We're going to go into the detail, but this is what's called Shira. So, let's go back again. Why is Shira different from Prosa, from Pros? The answer is very clear. When a person looks for meaning, Meaning will only be communicated to the, per- the reader. In other words, if I look at Psukim and I say, what does Psukim mean? I'm not going to try to understand it. How did the Chumash understand the meaning? How did, how did the people at the time of the Chumash understand the meaning? How is that meaning understood within the historical context? Meaning is always from the standpoint of the reader. I'm going to say, what does this meaning mean for me? What does this mean for me? In other words, when a person engages in philology, the meaning of a text. The meaning of the text is always going to be ex- exclusively within the context of the reader. Is that not contradictory? No, no, once again, once again. I want you let, let's try to understand what I'm saying. Shira? What, no, no, not Shira. Prose. Prose. Prose, which is which we spoke about, we spoke about, we spoke it's about like Robert Alter, was philology, meaning. Why is meaning not Shira? That's what we spoke about last time. Why is meaning not Shira? Because when a person asks a question, what does this text mean? What he really intends to say is, what does it mean for me? So, for example, if a person reads the Chumash and says, what is the message that's, that's being conveyed to me? What is the meaning? He's going to take meaning in terms of the world in which he lives in. In other words... In prose as opposed to... Sh- as opposed to right, prose. right, as opposed to Shia. In other words, in prose, I want to have something that's relevant for me, that's negated to me. So, for example... If you, if you, most people give a shirun chumash. If they're going to try to explain to an audience what does this puzzle mean, they're going to give a, they're going to bring a metaphor, a dubba from the world around them. No one's going to bring a dubba from two thousand years ago. Just hear what I'm saying. Masha Enke, what is poetry? Poetry means the reader has to place himself within a different context, within the context within which the text was produced. What's the problem? When I read La Havta, when I read Wuthering Heights, right. I've got to put myself into... No, that, 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 no that, that, that's a modern literary... That's a prose. I've got to put myself into... No, 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 but no, 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 no. Once again, you're, you're confused. He's when the Siv pr- says, when it's, even though there are things which are prose, the Nitziv says Shira. Shira, I think, would be literary. In other words, the, the Nitziv would call Wuthering Heights Shira. In other words... You, you, you're, you're confusing the English literature with the Tzib. The, the Shira doesn't mean, because the, the Chumash is not written on Shira. Let, let's hear what I'm saying. Yeah. The, the Torah is ostensibly not written. There's only part, there's only Shira Sayyam. There are only certain things which are Shira in the Torah. Right. When the Shira, when, when the Tzib says pro, poetry, as opposed to prose, he doesn't mean in the form that you're thinking. No. What he means is that poetry means, in order to understand this piece of literature, this text, I had to put myself in the context of where the text was produced. That's what we spoke about last time. Th- that's, pro- that's, poetry. that's poetry. That's poetry. Prose, which is narrative, as opposed to poetry means, so therefore the meaning is not clear. I can't garner the meaning from the words themselves. I have to place myself within the context. That's poetry. That's Shiva. 
I think you have to go back to sleep. Yeah, in other okay. words, let, 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 just see what just see what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. What Shira? Sorry. Shira means in Litziv, in order to understand the text, I have to place myself within the context within which the text was produced. Yes. So if I, if I read Weathering Heights, mm-hmm. what was that, the 18th century? Mm-hmm. I have to place myself within the 18th century. The Litziv would call that Shira. When I read a modern poem... Let, let's go, let me go further. When prose means... When I read a text, I don't think of the text as being produced in a different context. I think of the text communicating to me directly within my context. That's what the Tzip calls prose. But that's what modern uh, biblical poetry. I, let, let me. That's why I'm getting confused. Okay, fine. Say it. Sorry. So, if I look at the Chumash, what the, the traditional Mephoshim of the Chumash, trying to understand the Chumash is, what does the Chumash mean for me in my context, in the context of the reader in the 21st century? Tav Shinai and Dalit. Not what did the Chumash mean in the context when Klai Yisrael left Mitzrayim or when Klai Yisrael were in the Midbar. That's prose. The Nitziv says poetry, Shira, is I have to understand the Chumash within the context of when they left Mitzrayim when they were in the Midbar. That's called poetry. That's called Shira. That's what I explained in the last year. So therefore, if I want to understand the chait of Akas HaSela, I can't construe a whole pilpa, what was the Havavina, what was the Tehrets. That's not the way I understand it. I have to understand it is, what was the historical context within which HaKadosh Baruch Hu commands Moshe Rabbeinu to speak and not to hit the Sela, right? That historical context also has to be understood within the historical context of Chazal, who are transmitting that historical context through the Tehra Shabbi al And only then can I understand the Chumash. That's called Shira, that's called poetry, as opposed to prose. Even though prose in, 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 in modern literary criticism is understood like that, but the, 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 it would not translate literary terms. That's, that's the example. Right, right. You understand? Shira for the the tziv means plate the reader placing himself within the historic within the text of the text, mm-hmm. as opposed to philology, where the 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 reader imposes the text upon his own his own lifestyle, his own context. So therefore, a popular commentary in the Chumash makes things relevant. People want things to be negated to their lives. What am I interested in? What does that have to do for me? What does it mean for me? That is 99% of biblical commentary, of Pal Shanut, right? The Nitziv is writing a commentary, bringing us a commentary in which I have to place myself within the context of the Chumash itself. And that's here the fundamental basis and the methodology, and the, right, within which the Nitziv wrote this commentary on Magdava. The important thing is, is that just like the scientist cannot understand nature as it applies to him, but has to actually do experiments to understand the logic of nature, to the point that in the 20th century, the laws of quantum mechanics and relativity contradict our Zitzenleben, the way we understand it, you know, from our point of view. One has to somehow go beyond what's called normally sensory experience and try to understand a world which is ununderstandable. I mean, I ain't the Einstein-Bohr exchange. <laughs> so therefore, too, in the case here, a person has to somehow leave his context and understand it with a totally different context. That, that's, it. that's what makes it a very modern commentary. I'm forced to actually place myself within a historicist framework. That's the Nassif's commentary. So in other words, this is the important idea that emerges from the Sip's definition of Shira. It's not poetry and prose. I mean, James Joyce wrote prose, but you can't understand Pshat in James Joyce, certainly not in Finnegan's Wake. Right? The Sip would call Joyce poetry. That's called Shira. Right? Okay, fine. So, in other words, this here is the... the so, the, and now what's interesting is, is that modern quote-unquote commentary, and the sense is to be the zitzel label in the text. This is a modern idea. I think it originates, you know, quite late in history, maybe the 19th century, the 20th century. And there are other examples 
in which actually the Nitzim actually uses this form of historicist um, techniques in his commentary too. So very, very simply, for example, in the um, in, in the volume, in the volume, we have the Shema Yisrael, right? In the volume, we have the Shema Yisrael, and there. Um, Right in the volume, Perak Vav, Pasuk Dal, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad Ve'Avta Hashem Elokecha. So the Nitziv in um, Perak Vav, Pasuk Dal, in Shema Yisrael. So the Nitziv raises a question. It says Dikte Aramban Dikte, Am I Shina Loshen Azar Pasuk Dixiv B'Medabim? Right, Yosef um, Mikol Apasha Shemba'ben. In other words, Moshe Rabbeinu is speaking second person to Klai Yisrael, all of a sudden comes to Shema Yisrael. Mm-hmm. There's a change in the, in the language. It's not bad, right? So, the Tzipa stands, this is what you would call, this is, I, mean, I think they call what, for, uh, this is what we call, I think, form criticism. The Tzipa said Shema Yisrael was a tefillah, according to Chazal, from Yankov Avinu. Right? In Psachim Dafdun Gimel, the Chaim Yisrael said in the Klirel, when Moshe Rabbeinu wrote the Chumash, he incorporated the Shema Yisrael of our voice within the Vavim. This is what modern critics would call form criticism, or I think re- maybe redaction criticism. In other words, where the text is actually also redacting previous texts. Or, so in other words, says the Nitzv, what's happening is that this Shema Yisrael was from the time of Yankovino, right? An ancient declaration. And Moshe Rabbeinu took the Shema Yisrael and incorporated within, within the Barim, in which he's speaking to the Klai Yisrael. It's as if I would take something that you said and incorporate it and speak to an audience. So the Nitzim, once again, right, I think it's called form criticism. Okay, whatever it is. What the Nitzim is doing is, is that I have to understand that problems, quote unquote problems, or difficulties, kashas, in the text of the Chumash, which are raised by the Rishayim, the Rabban raised this crime, can be understood with a historical analysis, that if I'm incorporating another text or tradition within a text, so naturally there's going to be a change in the person, right? In the, you know, the person speaking. And that's how the Nesiv actually applies this historicist, right? Um, methodology in actually answering kashas of the Rishayna, right? I'm not clear that, I'm sure that, I don't know if anyone ever thought of that, so, you know, it's only from the top of the Ramban. So, in other words, what we see over here is, is that that's what's called shira. Shira means there is no meaning that pops up, pops out. A person has to actually understand thoroughly the historical context of the Chumash, with Chazal as his guide, and only by understanding that, a person can understand the historical context of the Chumash, and also, conversely, the historical context of Chazal, where Chazal are actually emerging. And that's really the Nesib's very important, what's unique about the Nesib's commentary. Okay, in Mitzvah we will continue um, next time from an undisclosed location in Yerushalayim, Kodesh. Everybody be well.